This meeting is being recorded. Very good evening and welcome to uh, uh, I'm so sorry. Very good evening to welcome to one and all. I am Momita from Kare, the designated session assistant for a seamless experience. And Clarnet is India's most trusted and widely used strategic platform with multiple enriching services exclusively for doctors. Clarnet is very proud to be a partner, to be a part, digital partner for this event organized by Oncology Integrated Society. Just a minute, uh, Mamita. Your voice has echoed like anything. And now um, even and now mine is echoing. Uh, ma'am, actually, uh, ma your voice is uh, again echoing, ma'am. It never happened any time. How is it for this time? Uh, okay, it seems okay. like the network like bandwidth, the network bandwidth uh, is low. And that is why it's happening. Network is low. Okay. okay. Now you tell. Now you tell. Is, it okay? Is it okay? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. All right. So we start so with the wiping of the land. Yes, ma'am. My voice is my is my, is my is my is my screen is visible, ma'am? Yeah. Your okay. screen is visible. Okay. 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 And the topic and of today's session is epithelial, epithelial, epithelial ovarian, ovarian carcinoma, carcinoma and, how and how to manage. So let's begin so today's session for today's which session I would like to would invite Dr. Deepthi Chaturvedi ma'am to take over. Over to you ma'am. Ma okay, even if it's echoing, okay, I'll continue. Even if it's echoing, I'll continue. But it'll be really disturbing, really I don't know. Disturbing. I don't know. Whether the audience will be able to hear it. Uh, okay, ma'am. No worries, ma'am. I'm checking with my team once. Uh, just uh, no worries, ma'am. I'm checking with my team once. Uh, just there. I think so. I think so. We three of us are in the same day. That must be the that reason be the you reason quit, I think, so it will be better so with you. Now is it, now is it, uh, 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 is it equaling uh, your yes, situation? Yes, yes, yes. There is some problem with the problem with it. Clarinet itself. My voice is also in the house. Dr. Roli. Uh, yeah, no, it's okay. I you have right. muted uh, everyone uh, just to check. Uh, Dipti, ma'am, can you please uh, speak, ma'am, so that I can check okay. this, uh, whether is it uh, uh, going or not? Okay, yes, yes, no. all good, ma'am, all good. Okay. Please, please continue. I'll start. Okay. Uh, you can put the poster. Uh, of the dia. Okay, ma'am, I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing. Okay. Uh, is my skin visible, ma'am? Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank yeah, you. Make so. it large. Yes. Okay. So, good evening and welcome all the participants and the uh, faculty members to this 26th webinar series, one of its kind with the Oncology Integrated Society and Dr. Chaturvedi Cancer Hospital in association with technical support of Clarence. This is a very important uh, topic and earlier we had talked about ovarian cancers and this time uh, due to the request of one of the members of the oncology group, uh, we decided to take up this uh, topic separately, epithelial ovarian cancers 
and its management to hold a new. And for that, we have esteemed uh, speaker, chairperson, and moderator, and co-chairperson, Dr. A.K. Chaturvedi, who is the proud owner of Dr. Chaturvedi Cancer Hospital and has been past president of UPARI and has taken many trainings abroad in Clone Catering Hospital and Exeter, Kyoto and uh, Finland, Germany and many other places. Has been co-guide to many theses of the pathology in the medicine department of BRD Medical College. Uh, even when the, there was no uh, radiotherapy unit in BRD Medical College, Gorakhpur. And he has been uh, receiving many awards and has uh, been co-authored many books and many theses and uh, publications. So over to you, Dr. A.K. Chaturvedi. Take your dice and introduce Dr. Meenu Gupta, the guest chairperson of the day. Thank you, Dr. Deepthi. Today, we are um, holding this uh, webinar for uh, on carcinoma ovary. As you know, ovarian cancer ranks fifth in the cancer death among the women. So it's very important. A woman's risk of getting ovarian cancer during her lifetime is 1 in 78. And today, we are going to... Uh, have this webinar on epithelial ovarian cancer, which is the most common type of ovarian cancer. And uh, nearly 90% of all ovarian cancer, it constitute about 90% uh, of all ovarian cancer. And for this, uh, we invite our chairperson, Dr. Meenu Gupta. Gupta. Meenu Gupta. Please put uh, our TV. Yes. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chaturvedi, Dr. Deepti, and Momita all. And organizing this is actually a need to talk over the ovarian malignancies. Not a very uncommon in our countries, but we will discuss later as Dr. Roli is with us and uh, she is a gynecologist with a fellow at BHU. A lot of work she has done. Uh, far as far as project was concerned and she had experience of uh, surgical experience of dealing with these cases and uh, we are going to listen Dr. Roli Purva from the BHU. Dr. Roli, are you ready with your uh, slides? You uh, are, uh, Dr. You uh, to... uh, can I introduce uh, can you? I... Yes, sure. Dr. <laughs> Mamita, please mute all. She has got many publications. Sir, now please unmute yourself, sir. So she has got many papers to his credit and she has organized many conferences and she has got vast experience in treating cancer patients. Now over to you, Professor Minu Gupta. You can go ahead with this. Uh, Dr. Chaturvedi, there was no need of uh, such introduction and uh, definitely it's good to join this group and uh, uh, your academician group and here I am uh, because the timing learning and uh, I am uh, uh, passing the slides towards Dr. Roli as I already introduced she is a gynae oncologist and uh, she has experience of oncology experience at PHU of operating these uh, ovarian malignancy cases. So let's listen from Dr. Roli. So kindly share your slides. Aminu, ma'am. Uh, 
uh, it seems like anyone sharing the the screen so i'm not able to uh, share the screen from my end so can you please uh, stop the screen sharing so that i can show the cv of dr uh, roli parwar ma'am thank you so much Please continue, ma'am. So, uh, as I told Dr. Uh, Roli, she is a uh, renowned and she is very popular doctor among her region, and uh, she has done fellowship in gynae oncology from uh, Institute of B H uh, U Banaras Hindu University, and her uh, basket is carrying lot of awards, and uh, she has presented. Her experience with the role of even PARP inhibitors, and uh, she is a member of various societies also. She has done, uh, apart from the oncology services in the cancer awareness programs and cancer treatment also. So, Dr. Roli, kindly uh, share your slides so that we can listen. Uh, just a kind interruptions, everyone. Uh, so to avoid any type of uh, echo problem or technical glitches, I would request everyone to mute themselves. Only the speaker can unmute. Okay. Um, yeah, we have that. Good evening, everyone. Uh, myself, Dr. Roli Kurwar. Thank you so much for inviting me to this prestigious uh, so that I can present my topic. Uh, thank you so much, Minu ma'am. I have heard a lot about you. Uh, so, ma'am, I am starting my topic. My, today, I am discussing about management of epithelial cancers of ovary. And uh, I will discuss uh, this only for in primary settings. Uh, first, about epidemiology. Epithelial ovarian cancer accounts for the 90% of malignant ovarian neoplasts. And uh, the in a women lifetime list, this is actually 1 in 75 and the chance of dying of the disease is 1 in 100. Uh, if we see the uh, top 10 most common cancers in the US data, like the CDC data that uh, showed that among the top 10 cancers, the breast is on the top and ovary is on 10th number. But the mortality with CO ovary is the fifth leading cause of death. So the CO ovary is more, more, it has more morbidity and more mortality than other cancers that are reported in women. So at a glance, uh, if we look at the data in 2023, it is a CR database, and in which we see there are one person new or among all cancer cases which are diagnosed in 2023, one percent of cases are of ovarian cancer, and just double the risk. It is 2.2 percent risk among all cancer types, and the five-year survival rate among all stages of ovarian cancer is around 50.8 percent. And uh, if we see these graphs, that uh, we can uh, say that the trend is decreasing, but still there is a huge uh, morbidity and mortality with COV. If we come to our epithelial ovarian cancers, uh, if we come to all ovarian cancers, then the maximum incidence is of epithelial ovarian cancer. As I have told, it is 90% cancers are epithelial. And among the epithelial, the most common cancer is papillary serous cyst adenocarcinoma, most common. Next is the borderline adenocarcinoma. Uh, adenocarcinoma not otherwise specified, endometrioid tumor. If we go to our age wise group, then we can see that uh, the most common is most common age group for developing of cancer ovaries is 55 to 64 years, that is 24%. Next common is 65 to 74 years, that is 21%. And another common is 45 to 54 years. So these are those all CR database. Uh, now we are coming to our WHO histology classification. Uh, it has divided epithelial ovarian cancers into eight categories. Most common are serous tumors, next is mucinous, endometrioid, clear cell tumor, Brenner's tumor, sevomucinous tumor, undifferentiated carcinoma, mesenchymal tumors, and mixed epithelial mesenchymal tumors. Uh, 
now if we are coming to staging uh, it's uh, staged by agcc and pigo both so uh, if we go to most common that we use is pigo staging so pigo has four categories in pigo one tumor is limited to ovaries only and it's one a it is one ovary one b it is both ovaries are involved but the uh, but the capsule is intact in one c the tumor either both ovary or one ovary is involved but uh, there is a reason that it could be a surgical sting that is one c one if capsule ruptured before surgery it is one c two and if malignant cells are positive in ascites or peritoneal portion it is category it is category one c three coming to category pigo category two uh, in pigo category two it is that tumor involves one of uh, tumor is in the pelvis but there is extension outside the ovary it could be either in plant on the uterus or tubes it is 2a or it is on other pelvic tissues it is 2b coming to category 3 in category 3 tumor is outside the pelvis uh, in uh, its 3a b c in 3a it is retroperitoneal lymph node involved it is 3a it is microscopic extra pelvic peritoneal involvement without with or without positive uh, lymph nodes so it is further divided either lymph node positive or negative then 3b is macroscopic deposits but that are less than 2 cm and 3c is macroscopic deposits that are more than 2 cm and uh, uh, this 4a uh, 3a already said 3a1 3a2 is divided that is metastasis of retroperitoneal lymph node it is less than 10 mm or more than 10 mm and coming to 4 that is the distant metastasis and 4a is pleural effusion with positive cytology and 4b is liver or splenic parenchymal mets ya fir transmural involvement of any body then coming to there are two most common terms that are used in primary epithelial ovarian cancer first is the primary debulking surgery ya primary complete cyto reduction and next is the interval debulking surgery so primary treatment or primary debulking surgery is surgical staging for that is we do comprehensive surgical staging and debulking surgery followed in most patients by systemic chemotherapy and interval debulking surgery is that first we give new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by we used to do interval debulking surgery and then it is followed by adjuvant chemotherapy so uh, there is a one study that is published in minerva medica in 2019 and uh, it uh, actually it's a meta analysis which was done of rcts to show that what is the difference between if you do primary debulking surgery and interval debulking surgery what is the difference in survival so there are 22 to 20 studies were included in the review and they have concluded that uh, actually there is no difference in overall survival and progression free survival in the treatment of advanced ovarian cancer however there is a surgical complexity and post operative complications are reduced in the interval debulking surgery group then coming to our primary surgery uh, it's uh, said that primary surgery is to be done by gynec oncologists they are published in two outcomes and the most uh, common approach is open laparotomy approach closing section might be needed Uh, uh, in doing the surgical, in doing the surgical, that is comprehensive surgical staging, the three things should be recorded uh, after OT. That what is the extent of initial disease in the pelvis, abdomen, and upper abdomen, and whether a complete or incomplete resection was achieved, or if resection was incomplete, then what is the size of residual was left in the abdomen. Uh, role of as we as I already said that it is a open approach is the preferred approach. Laparoscopic approach can be done in a advanced cancers in which we can go and we can see that how much is complete cyto reduction is possible or not possible that's called assessment laparoscopy so if it is not possible then we can proceed with lsat and we can go with further interval debulking surgery uh, then uh, there are certain fertility sparing options for fertility as i said fertility sparing surgery can be possible in cancer ovary but it is only possible for stage 1 disease or if the tumor is borderline tumor so for a stage 1 epithelial tumor it is seen in various studies that there is no difference in disease free survival and overall survival compared to radical surgery and uh, it is that clear cell histology is the most morbid condition for stage 1 but uh, for the but certain studies are there that show that there is no increased risk of relapse or short term survival compared to radical surgery Uh, so uh, the indication for fertility sparing surgery are early stage invasive epithelial tumors low molecular low malignant potential tumors that are borderline tumors malignant germ cell tumors or malignant sex called stromal tumors uh, 
uh, it is said that in fertility sparing surgery, if both ovaries are involved, then bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy can be done, sparing the uterus. That can be used for surrogacy. And the data show that approximately 30% of patients are up stage when we do presume early stage surgery. So uh, when we are doing fertility sparing surgery, it is said that you have to do comprehensive surgical staging apart from USO or ulinateral salpingo-oophorectomy or bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy. Then coming to what is debulking surgery, actually what are the certain steps? There are certain steps and there are certain guidelines to be followed when we are going for debulking surgery. So debulking surgery is an important component of initial treatment for patients with clinical stage 2, 3 and stage 4 disease. And uh, optimal cytoreduction is defined as residual disease less than 1 cm in maximum diameter. Or uh, maximum and uh, the optimal cytoreduction, the, our goal of surgery is to achieve optimal cytoreduction. But our maximal effort should be there that we should achieve at least R0 resection. So, jitna bhi as, uh, as much tissue we can be left and there's a better prognosis in COV. So, complete side reduction is, uh, some, uh, two words are used, complete side reduction is the disease is apparently confined to the ovary or to the pelvis. And uh, optimal side reduction is that all abdominal, pelvic and retroperitoneal disease with newly diagnosed invasive epithelial ovary cancer involving the pelvis and upper abdomen. Now there are certain steps. First, after there's a midline, uh, abdomen is open midline and uh, aspiration of ascites, if there's ascites is there, or we can do peritoneal lavage by instilling 50 cc of normal saline and uh, we can heparinize the sample and we will send it for cytology. And for patients with disease apparently confined to an ovary or to the pelvis, all peritoneal surfaces should be visualized. Any peritoneal surface or addition suspicious for happening metastasis should be selectively excised or biopsied. It is said that at least minimum five biopsy samples should be taken, two from paracolic gutters, two from under surface of diaphragm, and one from the pelvis. Absence of any suspicious areas or random peritoneal biopsy should be taken. For if there are any suspicious areas, then we can take. Hysterectomy followed by hysterectomy and BSO should be done. And every effort should be made to keep an encapsulated ovarian mass intact during removal. This is the most important thing for any stage in the property we do for cancer ovary. The ovarian, uh, the ovarian surface should not get ruptured. Because if it is get ruptured, we will upstage the disease during our surgery only. If it is 1A, 1A, 1B, both are criteria for 1A and 1B, that capsule should be intact. So it should be stressed that the ovarian tissue which we are removing or the ovarian mass which is removing, we should not rupture it. Then next, after doing washings and after doing THBSO, next is omentectomy. But now there is uh, two, the total omentectomy done or infrapolic omentectomy is done. So if the disease is confined to the pelvis, resume the stage one or two, we can go for infrapolic omentectomy. If it is advanced, it is stage three or four, we can go for total omentectomy. Now, uh, coming to the role of lymphadenectomy. Lymphadenectomy is a very controversial topic in cancer ovary. Lymphadenectomy should be done or should not be done. There are various randomized control trials and various observational studies done to show the role of uh, lymphadenectomy in cancer ovary. But uh, the recent, most recent is a LION trial. Uh, it is a HARTERS trial that is done published in 2018. After that, there was no published RCT. So the line trial is shown that uh, line trial took two groups. Uh, one, uh, the, the inclusion criteria in line trial was that that patient should have macroscopically a disease confined to the pelvis and clinically lymph node should not enlarge. It should be less than one centimeter. So they randomized in the two groups. One, they, they proceed with a systematic lymphadenectomy and in other group, they didn't do anything. So uh, what they have found that systematic lymphadenectomy means we have done whole complete pelvic lymph node dissection and paraiotic dissection up to inferior mesenteric or up to renal vessel. So what they have found that during lymphadenectomy there was no improve, uh, there was no improvement in progression free survival of and overall survival and and eventually lymphadenectomy is leading to increased post operative complications and mortality within sixty days after surgery. So, uh, what they have concluded that there is uh, that lymphadenectomy that there are further studies needed that further more trials needed and they uh, they uh, they were unable to comment that lymphadenectomy should be done or should not be done. 
So, according to NCCN guideline, they recommend that pelvic and paraortic lymph node dissection is recommended for patients with disease confined to affected ovaries or to the pelvis, or with or with more extensive disease who have tumor nodules outside the pelvis that are less than two centimeter. Presume stage three B. Paraortic lymph node dissection minimum up to the level of inferior mesenteric artery and preferably up to the level of the renal vessels. So, if paraortic lymph node dissection for a systematic lymphectomy, we have to do pelvic dissection. We have to do paraortic lymph node dissection. And if it is not possible to do paraortic, at least paraortic lymph node sampling should be done. It is minimum in COB stage. For uh, systemic lymph node dissection and resection of clinically negative node, it is required for more extensive disease outside of the pelvis. Uh, that is, if they are, uh, if we are planning for. If, if it just for berry picking, that is only enlarged nodes should be there. So if the tumor is more, if their nodules are more than two centimeter, then we cannot affect the survival of the patient. And the only thing is we can do that uh, debulking. How much debulking we can do? So uh, this is lymphectomy, and uh, it is a uh, one uh, meta analysis which was published by me, W World Journal of Surgical Oncology, which was done on lymphectomy in ovarian cancers. And there are, uh, I have only three RCTs in 2022. I have published, and I have only three RCTs till now. Uh, and what I have seen that uh, hazard ratio, I have, uh, hazard ratio for progression free survival, but the, uh, progression free survival was slightly improving, that is, favoring lymphadenectomy, but there was no effect on overall survival on doing systematic lymphadenectomy. So there was increased PFS, but with, uh, with, uh, but the progression free survival, which was increasing, it didn't show any statistical significance. But there is a still greater number of well conducted trials needed to conclude to whether so that we can proceed with lymphadenectomy or not. Now, uh, for debulking uh, procedure, apart from TH, so bubble dissection or appendicectomy, stripping of the diaphragm, splenectomy, partial cystectomy, urethro neocystostomy, partial hepatectomy, partial gastrectomy, any of the surface, peritoneal surface which is involved. We have to take out that is called CRS. Then coming to for mucinous tumor, it is a long based uh, that uh, we have. Uh, it was old school thought that if it is a mucinous tumor, we have to do appendicectomy in all the cases. If we found it is a mucinous tumor, appendicectomy should be done. But uh, what the guidelines say that say if a normal if in a mucinous tumor, if we found a normal appendix, then it doesn't require surgical resection. Upper and for mucinous tumor, you have to visualize upper and lower GI tract to rule out any occurred GI primary. And a serum CEA level should also be done. And if we found that appendicectomy need to be performed. Now coming for borderline tumors, uh, data show that lymphadenectomy does not affect overall survival. So for borderline tumors, as we are told, TH, BSO plus peritoneal biopsies plus omentectomy can be done. And uh, because this to upstage the disease if it is a borderline or if it came out to be a epithelial ovarian cancer. Uh, now it's a uh, role of hormone replacement therapy in cancer ovary. Its guidelines say that uh, in uh, ovarian cancer, HRT can be given. It doesn't worsen survival in pre-menopausal patients with gynecological cancers. Uh, there are certain palliative surgical procedures which can be performed with a debulking surgery like paracentesis, insertion of indwelling peripheral catheter, thoracosynthesis, thoracoscopy, nephrostomy, gastrostomy, intestinal stent, surgical relief of intestinal obstruction. These are palliative procedures. Uh, in my slide, I will go over. Uh, primary treatment for patients referred with diagnosis by previous surgery. Uh, if the uh, the important thing is that if uh, the patient is referred to us, if the outside THBSO is done and the patient is referred to us, that now what should do? It came out to be stage one epithelial ovarian cancer. THBSO is done, and now what further should be done? So first step is that to look for if there are any residual disease or not in the abdomen. So uh, if we look if if we look for any residual disease in the abdomen, then we have to go if we, if we think that we can resect it. Definitely we have to go for resection or debulking surgery. If we think that it is unresectable, we have to go for chemotherapy, and then we have to go for resection of the tumor. So there are certain NCC and recommended options following upfront primary surgery. That is, I am telling for stage one epithelial, for stage one epithelial ovarian cancer, we have done a staging laparotomy for stage one epithelial ovarian cancer. Now the next question comes: if, if we have to give adjuvant therapy or not? So uh, the NCCN says that in mucinous carcinoma and in grade one endometrioid tumor, both stage one and stage one B, 
only observation can be done. Otherwise, in all stage one cancers, you have to give adjuvant therapy. And uh, this is uh, for this is for uh, this table is for if we got adjuvant therapy if we for stage two to four ovarian cancer. So for in, in stage two to four ovarian cancer, in all the stages, you have to give adjuvant therapy. Uh, now, what are the recommended regimes? The most common, the most preferred regime is carboplatin, paclitaxel, carboplatin area under curve 5 and paclitaxel 175, 3 weekly and minimum 6 cycles should be given. It is category 2A and it is NCCL recommended. Other regimes are pecli carbo weekly, uh, carboplatin liposomal doxorubicin, docetaxel carboplatin, but the most preferred is paclitaxel carboplatin. There are many trials that have proven that this regime is the best regime for adjuvant therapy. Uh, now, this is the forest stage 1 epithelial ovarian cancer. Uh, there is also LCCM recommending paclitaxel and carboplatin, the same regime for stage 1 epithelial ovarian cancer. And uh, three weekly cycle minimum, uh, it is recommending that for stage 1 cancer, if it is a high grade series, then six cycles are recommended. But if it is other than high grade series, we can give only three cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy at this category 2 weight recommendation. Now, if the patient is aged more than 70 years and there are other comorbidities associated, then we can reduce the dose of paclitaxel to 135 mg per meter square and uh, the given for three to six cycles according to a stage and cancer subtype or other regime that is paclitaxel 60 mg per meter square uh, followed by carboplatin area under curve 2 or day 1, 8 and 15, which should be repeated every 21 days for six cycles. It is a weekly regime and it is a three weekly regime. Uh, now, coming to our new adjuvant chemotherapy. Now, what are the indications for new adjuvant chemotherapy? As I have already said, that primary debulking surgery is the standard of treatment for cancer ovary. But new adjuvant chemotherapy can be done if we found that is a medically, that uh, surgically we can't resect the complete tumor or we can left the disease, or the patient is in not in a good medical condition, then we can operate on that patient. So, for that patient, we can go for new adjuvant chemotherapy. So as already said, the advanced stage disease and the anticipated benefit which from NACD would be to allow for medical improvement or clinical response that will increase the likelihood of optimal cytoreduction at interval debulking surgery. So after NACD, interval debulking surgery should also receive post-operative adjuvant therapy. Although an NACD approach was associated with improved surgical outcome, trials suggest that reported PF reported progression-free survival and overall survival found no significant differences when compared with the conventional primary debulking surgery approach. Uh, now, what are the patient selection? Uh, cancer type, uh, what is the type of cancer? And what is the potential response to primary chemotherapy? Uh, NACD is not suitable for non-epithelial cancers and the disease apparently confined to the ovary. Uh, now, it's a slide that I'm showing uh, that uh, it is important that before starting any NACD, we need the tumor biopsy. Uh, you need to confirm the tumor, what is this type of tumor is there. So, in our in my practice, we usually at the stage, uh, if it is 3B above, we used to do, uh, we used to go for tumor, but we used to go, we used to go for ultrasound guided tumor biopsy, or if not possible, tumor biopsy is not possible, then we can go for also cytopathology. Uh, cytopathology either from ascites or pleural effusion or we can do FNAC and uh, uh, we can start for our NACD on the basis of tumor biopsy or on the basis of cytopathology. Combined with cytopathology, there should also be a CA-135 CE ratio that should be more than 25 and all patients with histologically confirmed ovarian fallopian tumor primary calcium cancer should undergo genetic risk evaluation. Now, what are the NACD regimes? These are, NA, these are NCCM recommended regimes. And most common regime that is uh, tested, uh, I am showing there are certain studies. Uh, the most common regime that is used is paclitaxel carboplatin in all the studies. Uh, I have highlighted all that. And all in all the studies, they have found that with paclitaxel carboplatin, there is a improved uh, uh, survival rate. Now, these are the uh, juvenile treatment after NACD. So, uh, the one thing is that if the patient has received NACD done, it should, or then, then the patient should also be go for, uh, then the patient should also be uh, eligible for adjuvant therapy. 
so for iv regimes they are same that you give four to six cycles of uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by you can go for adjuvant chemotherapy and if you are planning for intraperitoneal with iv regime then there are certain uh, difference between iv and iv regimes ncgm recommends three to four cycles of nct before interval debulking surgery Although surgery after four to six cycles may be used based on the clinical judgment of the treating gynecologist, and uh, it should be after after giving NCT, we have to do response evaluation according to the RESIST criteria. It could be complete response, partial response, stable disease, or disease is persistent or increasing. So if there is a complete response or partial response of the disease, we can go for optimal site reduction with interval debulking surgery. If completion is likely to be BSO in site reduction for a stable disease. We have to go for after three to four cycles of NCT. We have two options: either we can switch to treatment for persistent or recurrent disease, or we can increase the same cycle of chemotherapy for two or more cycles to assess for further disease. If we have found that there is a response, then we can go for surgery. If there is no response, then we can switch the treatment for recurrent treatment. Uh, there are certain online surgical risk calculators are there to decide. Whether IDS is safe or not, that is modified Charlsman comorbidity index, ASA status, or modern Frehley scale and ACS surgical risk calculator. Uh, the same procedures that are to be followed for primary debulking, same are to be followed for interval debulking procedure. Completion is expected to be BSO, comprehensive staging, suspicious or enlargement should be detected, and removal of lymph nodes. Uh, it is important that the lymph nodes which are noted pre-NCT, which are enlarged. And has the chances of potential metastasis should be removed at the time of interval debulking surgery. Now I am coming to the hyper hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy at the time of interval debulking surgery. The rationale for using the hyper is that heat increases penetration of the chemotherapy at the peritoneal surface and increases the chances of sensitivity of cancer cells to chemotherapy by inhibiting DNA repair. There are two approaches: open and closed technique. And uh, HIPEC is protocol that are generally used in prospective trials. Usually, perfuse chemotherapy for 60 to 90 minutes. Uh, the advantages of intraoperative uh, it could be given intraoperative or it can be given early postoperative period. Intraoperative intraperitoneal administration may enable better perfusion of the peritoneal space because adhesions will not have yet formed. What the guidelines said is that HIPEC is an option for patients who have response or stable disease after NCT. At least three uh, NACT uh, and all patients treated with NACT and interval debulking surgery should receive post-op chemotherapy. Importantly, not for patients with primary debulking surgery so with or without optimal site reduction. It is very important that NACT that the trials which have done for high tech they have shown that there is only increase in progression free survival and overall survival if high tech is given after NACT and IDS they have not shown any response in primary debulking surgery. Then there are certain complications of high tech, like excessive blood loss, increase in lymph node and post op mortality, and there are certain major complications like various type of fistulas, abscesses, infections, intra abdominal infection, bowel perforation, hemorrhages. Now there's a uh, it is a meta analysis that is published in 2022 in ESMO journal. There were six RCTs were included, and they have found that combination of high tech with interval CRS and NACT significantly improved the five year progression free survival and disease free survival. Compared with standard treatment alone, in the absence of new adjuvant chemotherapy, the use of high tech plus some uh, plus side reduction was not associated with any survival advantage. Uh, in most prospective studies that have tested high tech, the surgery prior to uh, high tech, that it is also important that when we are doing high tech, there should be a R zero resection or the tumor which is left, it should be less than one centimeter. If it is not optimally debulked, there is no role of high tech. The NCCN recommended HIPEC regime is cisplatin 100 mg per meter square and it is used in OB, OB HIPEC trial and is the most common recommended agent. Uh, now, after doing, uh, now, it's a, uh, now I'm coming to adjuvant systemic therapy. Adjuvant systemic therapy, it is that if we have completed the primary therapy, that is, we have done primary debulking surgery or we have given, we have done primary debulking surgery and we have given adjuvant chemo. And if we have done NACT and IDS, then we have to plan an adjuvant chemo. And uh, it is important that with the stage one disease, only observation is needed. There is no further adjuvant therapy needed. Uh, then for stage two to four disease after primary therapy, that is surgery plus chemotherapy, we have to classify the patient. Either there is a complete response or there is partial response or there is stable disease. The management will depend on the stage of the patient and what are the 
uh, what is the primary therapy given and in which stage patients are standing. Uh, the adjuvant therapy, the there are adjuvant therapies. The uh, uh, most common it is a bevacizumab, and it, uh, uh, the most common adjuvant therapy that uh, are there are two. We have two options for adjuvant therapy. One is bevacizumab, other is PARP inhibitors. So bevacizumab, it is the agent uh, which. Uh, uh, NCCN say that if we are starting bevacizumab to any tumor, then it should be started in new adjuvant chemotherapy regime or it should be started after primary debulking surgery. We have to start her on after adjuvant, uh, in adjuvant therapy regime and we can continue it after completing our four to six cycles of adjuvant chemo. Uh, this is uh, the NCCN say that we have that, that we can only give bevacizumab it is given if it is given in new adjuvant therapy or adjuvant therapy. But the FDA recommends that we can give bevacizumab after completing our adjuvant therapy. That is carbopecli. If, if we are given carbopecli paclitaxel, we can start on bevacizumab after completing our primary treatment. Then uh, the indications for giving that in which tumors we can go for bevacizumab therapy, uh, we can go for all high stage, stage three or four tumors, if uh, all stage or if the tumor is incompletely resected. Then coming to our PARP inhibitors, there are three FDA approved PARP inhibitors are there. Niraparib, Olaparib, and Rukaparib. Only two PARP inhibitors are approved for primary treatment of ovarian cancers, Niraparib and Olaparib. And there are certain studies which have studied Olaparib with Bevacizumab combination is also studied. Uh, now, as I said, Bevacizumab for stage 3 or 4 disease following initial surgical resection. For uh, Niraparib, Niraparib is the only PARP inhibitor that uh, we, have, uh, we have studied that the PARP inhibitors that they have a role in BRCA mutated population or there is homologous recombination deficient group, we can use PARP inhibitors. But the, there are studies, there are trials that show that niraparib can work without in, in absence of BRCA mutation. So if the patient has achieved complete response or partial response to first line platinum based chemotherapy, we can start our niraparib maintenance. Uh, Olaparib, uh, the indication for giving Olaparib, the patient has deleterious or suspected deleterious uh, somatic BRCA mutation. Uh, in combination with Bevacizumab for the treatment, it, it, another, we can also use Olaparib for the combination in combination with Bevacizumab. Lucaparib has only role in recurrent ovarian cancer, it has no role in primary ovarian cancer. Uh, then what is the Bevacizumab, NCCL recommended Bevacizumab re uh, regime. Uh, it's uh, combined with pachyrexel and carboplatin. We can start on bevacizumab. There are two trials basically on bevacizumab, ICAL-7 and GOG-218. Uh, so the main difference is that in ICAL-7 uh, in ICAL-7 trial, there's a dose of 7.5 mg per kg. And in GOG-218 trial, they use 15 mg per kg dose was used. And uh, uh, in both of the trials, they have found that in the BRCA mutation subgroup, uh, there was no improvement in PFS or, uh, PFS or overall survival, but without precondition, the effect was seen. So uh, it's said that bevacizumab should not be used in a precondition population. Uh, in precondition population, bevacizumab alone is not recommended. And this is the maintenance treatment options after first time completing chemotherapy. Uh, uh, as we have seen that uh, first we have to look for a stage of the tumor. If it is stage one, then there is no treatment that no maintenance need is there. If we come to stage two to four, in uh, stage two to four, we have to look for if there's a BRCA mutation or it is a normal, it's a wild type mutation. Uh, so in stage two to four, if it is a BRCA mutated population, then obviously maintenance of choice is TARP inhibitors. If, uh, if, we have, if, if we have found that is a BRCA is wild type, then we can go for bevacizumab or bevacizumab plus odaparib. Then now coming to take home message. Take home message is that we have to think that epithelial ovarian cancer has a, has a great mortality and morbidity among all the cancers. And primary debulking surgery uh, is with complete cytoreduction reduction is the primary treatment of choice. And our goal of resection should be R0 resection. If general condition of the patient did not permit or if the surgical boundaries cannot be uh, made, then we can go for NACD and interval debulking surgery. All patients of epithelial ovarian cancers need histological confirmation before starting of new adjuvant chemotherapy. Upon pathological confirmation of ovarian cancer, palliative cancer, or primary peripheral cancer, patients should be referred for a genetic research evaluation and germline and somatic testing. It is a must, must, must. Then, uh, gynec oncologist should be involved in all the treatment planning. Combination of high tech with interval CRS and NACD significantly improved the five year 
inflammation free survival and disease free survival uh, for adjuvant therapy i think some of you know that adjuvant therapy is only needed uh, if we have, if adjuvant therapy is not needed in stage 1 cancer but for stage 2 to 4 we have to go for adjuvant therapy and uh, for maintenance therapy as i have already shown that uh, if we have, we have to go for germline testing we have to go for breca testing and then we can decide that we have to go for maintenance or not thank you so much thank you dr roli thank you for presenting it so nicely in a very nutshell every aspect you have covered especially ncsm guidelines for the advanced and cases and uh, it's really nice very well explained what surgery what type of surgery we have to do and what chemotherapy we have to use so now your expert comment dr minu professor minu You are mute, I think. Momita, please. Audible? Yeah, Dr. Roli, thank you. Thanks for the nice presentation. And uh, uh, I think we have some students are also connected here. So as far as the students' perspective is there, we can discuss uh, uh, as far as the Dr. Roli has told details about the ovarian malignancy. and it is not very uncommon we can see in our country in our teen our opds we can see our female oncologist or gynae oncologist where our clinics they are no. full of this patient uh, yes ma'am so uh you can paste routine them routine am i audible na? yes ma'am you are audible okay so routine because students are with us routine our opd we are getting all these patient mostly in the advanced diseases huh? we can, uh, we must agree most of the cases they are reporting with the advanced stage stage 3 stage 4 onwards but it is very important where we are confusing once we are getting the patient at our opd whether it's a gynae opd some physician opd or general surgeon mostly the presentation whether it is the gi is some malignancy once they are presenting with some pelvic lump or it is the ovarian malignancy again we are lacking molecular oncology as far as these con uh, tumors are concerned not a uh, uh, lot of markers are available actually for the pgs if a patient with ovarian lump is concerned and mostly gi we are getting all these patients are uh, emaciated as for the clinical you should not jump straight way over to the investigation and pet imaging and all that and students are sitting there sometimes they are coming to the opd okay go for uh, getting the prescription go for um, direct imaging and all that clinical evaluation is very important by the gynecologist and detail examination history taking is very important any lump in the abdomen in the pelvis but you have to rule out gi versus uh, this ovarian pathology good ultrasound and any uh, we are the living in a country with the limited resources straight way not jumping to the high investigation good pelvic cc is important no i would like to uh, comment over the screening programs we have screening for the cervix and we are screening from the breast but for the ovarian there is as such no uh, recommended screening program they have their own pitfalls and shortcoming benefits not benefit that is another issue but where the uh, talk of screening is concerned genetic counseling and genetic screening whatever that is a part of the diagnosis once the patients are diagnosed they are coming to us we are talking about the okay go for the family history and send this uh, patient for the all the mutation analysis and all that as such there is no uh, different screening options are there again the lot of work for the gynecologist our oncopathologist as for the multidisciplinary is concerned the role of oncopathologist the role of gynecologist the role of medical oncologist so uh, there are no i, I think uh, we don't have the very strong uh, predictive uh, biomarkers except the ca125 and again they are not very very specific uh, sometimes lumps are there if they are having the mucinous 
then you have to go for the CEA as Dr. Roli has very well said, CA 125 CEA ratio, we have to go for this. And as far as the molecular biomarkers are there, so I am straight away coming to the staging of the disease, early stage, there is no confusion. You have to go for straight away for it is a case of the surgeon, go for the surgery. But again, if the stage is low, stage is low and uh, know the ESCO guidelines, they have come stage one and if they have further stratified into the grading of the tumors. If there is a grade to moderately differentiated, again, there are some markers, they have come actually how many are applied in our country. You can go for the P53, which is not again in our routine practice, whether you go for the adjunct chemotherapy or not. But here my point is again, again we are having lack of the oncology practice. In this concern, if there are the brain malignancies are concerned, but in the ovarian malignancies, again we have to utilize these molecular biomarkers, which are actually available because the further recurrence can be prevented. A new urgent chemotherapy, Dr. Roli has very well explained all the protocols, their benefits, the risk of the minimal, uh, 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 like uh, complete uh, or partial pathological response, what is the benefit of the overall survival is there or not. So genetic counseling, as I already uh, uh, just mentioned, so because again for the adjuvant and maintenance, Biva Suzumab, Biva drugs and all that are there. Again, students are there if you are uh, uh, practicing this bevacizumab and all that and patient coming to your OPD with a raised CA125, don't get scared and uh, don't scare the patient also because only CA125 is not the biomarker and you have to see the clinical examination and you have to correlate the radiological response also, not only the CA125. As far as the recommendation is there, if you are using anti angiogenic agents are there like bevacizumab and other. Yes, if they are uh, platinum sensitive, you can go for again the uh, this platinum exposure to these patients. And uh, I have uh, again a question for Dr. Roli. Dr. Roli, sometimes we are seeing in our uh, clinics and all that after uh, near trend NACT is locally advanced and patients are going for the surgical good response. And after a year or, uh, or two years later, their platinum cells, some cases are presenting with a solitary nodule in the pelvis. So what, what you will recommend, should we again uh, expose this patient for the chemo or uh, we can go straight away for the surgery? So what practice in your institute like? Case I'm of the locally... Uh, um, if we, uh, then, um, we can go for local tumor resection if it is possible at that time. And uh, if, uh, if already two years have completed the plant treatment, then if, if it seems that it is inoperable, then we can go for another platinum agent or uh, another, we can go for another chemotherapy. Okay. So, uh, these are the, actually, this is a heterogeneous presentation of these patients. Sometimes, because some patients are coming to our clinics and uh, again they are re-challenged with the uh, platinum and uh, uh, re with the first line, second line drugs are there. Still, uh, there are no predictive biomarkers. When we are uh, exposing this patient to the chemotherapy, we don't have any predictive biomarker if they are res will respond to platinum or not. Some clinical trials were going with some uh, genetic analysis and some genes were there. Uh, to check the resistance of that. Again, that are not very widely used in our country. And uh, as Dr. Roli already told before, surgery, frozen sections and all that are very important. To just to wind up uh, today's discussion, ovarian malignancy for the students, a good clinical history is very important. Good clinical
I think there is a net problem. Yes, I thought कि मेरा ही चला गया है. There is problem with it. Uh, All are muted, so we. I thought there is some other problem. Anyway, Doctor Beg, you wanted to ask some question. Let us see if Roli can answer. Can help you out. You are muted. Just unmute yourself. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I can hear. Again, you have muted. Doctor Beg has muted himself. Doctor Beg. You unmute yourself. Dr. Big, can you hear me? I think I have some problem. Somebody uh, wants to ask you regarding Krugenberg tumor. Is there any separate policy for Krugenberg tumor management of Krugenberg? So Krugenberg tumor are entirely dealt separately. Uh, so yeah. Krugenberg tumor could be a primary ovarian, could be metastasis from some other gastric cancers or other cancers. So they are dealt basically what are their biopsy uh, because we can't proceed uh, directly in Krugenberg tumor. We can't proceed directly with surgery. We have to go for uh, some ultrasound guided biopsy or FNAC could be possible. So to decide what is the nature of the tumor, what is the stage, and uh, what are the and uh, another important thing is to go for any uh, that's a genetic part of the tumor. Uh, if it is uh, if it is colonic or it is gastric or it is uh, from primary from ovarian. So depend or depending on the type and depending on the origin of the tumor, it is get treated. So Krugenberg tumor is entirely a different topic, and it depends on its origin, uh, which type of management can be given to it. Sorry, I was uh, disconnected in between, was, and uh, I couldn't yeah. listen. Yeah, to today our topic was epithelial, na epithelial. Then we will do it again. Krugenberg will be done again. It was so, epithelial. Uh, like, uh, Another topic. Topic for yes, Dr. Beg, you wanted to ask something. I think so. Now you are unmuted. You can speak. Yes. Dr. Beg, you are unmuted. You can speak. Dr. Beg, you are unmuted. You can speak. Dr. Beg, you are unmuted. Uh, molecular uh, markers or what can we have for this patient? You have to unmute, Dr. Bay. Okay. Sir, again, you are on mute, sir. Okay. Now it is. I'm audible. Okay. Yes, sir. You are audible. Okay, I just want to know that uh, actually, is there any standardized chemotherapy regime for the uh, Krugenberg tumor? Uh, we uh, uh, a large number of cases having a bilateral ovarian involvement, and then uh, uh, most of them, so the primary is from the pyloric uh, antrum. As for the data, the seventy percent from pyloric antrum, twelve percent from bowel, and a five percent of breast and a a gold bladder malignancy but uh, i have not not yet found a very standardized chemotherapy regime after the this thing it's krugenberg tumor is supposed to be a metastatic almost when the krugenberg tumor is uh, diagnosed it is being said the primary is come from there and stuck to different area distant stations so the surgery is absolutely ruled out so we have to depend upon only chemotherapy as a palliative setup so i could if uh, dr roli punwar can uh, address about the point of any uh, regime uh, of a chemotherapy uh, if you did get a primary like suppose pyloric antrum then you can go for that kind of chemotherapy or as in 
some individualized chemotherapy is there for uh, crook and bulk tumor because these are very common occurrence and we fight this thing and i didn't get found any in the uh, general regarding the detailed description regard uh, of the crook and bulk tumor management thank you sir thank you so much for the question Sir, as part as what I have read is that crooked bulk tumors will be metastases from primary certain GI, like it could be from gallbladder, it could be from stomach, it could be from colon. So uh, before proceeding for any chemotherapy, we have to do, we have to see that what is the tissue of origin, and we have to go for stool markers. We have to also go for molecular markers that what can be adjuvant therapy that can be targeted to this tumor. So the it is a tailored treatment for crooked bulk tumor. Actually, it is a tailored type of therapy which we can do. We can we have to decide that if it is from the stomach, we have to go for clot regime. If it is from colon, we have to go for cortex. And accordingly, what was the molecular analysis? We have to go to do the mismatch repair efficiency or what type of targeted agent we can further use. It's it okay, but but Roli, I'd like to yes, interrupt. He wants to say that is there any blanket? Treatment like where you don't have molecular analysis and all those things, is there any blanket regime like you can just give blindly? In fact, I can tell. Dr. Dr. and Roli, I can tell if the primary site is somewhere else, so you yes. have to take the primary, and that will be the treatment for the multi tumor. Later on, you can select out and take out the thing and. But the sensitivity of the crooked bulk tumor will depend upon the primary site. The chemotherapy, which is effective on the primary site, will be effective on crooked bulk tumor. And later on, you can take out the disease, but the primary has to be removed. Primary has to be removed. Then this is. You can. Uh, I think. Add to it. I mean, uh, Dr. actually, this is not actually a good, very good question. Sir, sir, I am very well satisfied by Dr. Roli Punwar because she also addressed uh, root cause of, uh, to investigate the root cause of a primary. But if you do investigate even the root cause of a primary, the almost disease is in a stage four. So uh, I just want to share my experience that what I do in the Krukenberg tumor, and then even if we don't find any primary tumor, and then uh, we start from a gemcitabine cisplatin chemotherapy and with a CEA level monitoring, and they have a good results. But I did not get uh, in the various uh, studies that there is a, a, a role of a gemcitabine and cisplatin. But clinically, we are getting this response. But one or two research studies being done. But uh, I think Roli Purvar will uh, find out the more strengthened way to elaborate in the next lecture here so that we can be yeah. updated. So, yeah. <laughs> because... Uh, I only have to go with series of ovarian series. <laughs> yes, we do. Next series of ovarian cancer. Then she gone. Next, uh, I'm very. I must congratulate Dr. Roli Pudwat for her elaborate really lecture. Well. She's delivered a very yeah, good lecture, nice. and also the role of uh, olaparib and role of uh, these uh, uh, agents on the BRCA mutations. These are very, very important medical organisms. Minu, anyway, what's your thank say? You. <laughs> Dr. Minu, again, our video is fixed. I think there is some problem. This video got fixed. So, Dr. Shatrivedi, please conclude. So it's a nice discussion, and uh, Dr. Minu and uh, Dr. Lee both have done very justice to the topic. Regarding ovarian cancer, it's very nice. And Dr. Big has added crooked work tumor, gemcitabine, and uh, platinum treatment that might be working on the primary site as well. So there he is getting response, and it needs further study because uh, the cancer is a thing of research. Yeah, so further study that right. Similarly, for the IPEC also, we are in suit. We don't know what to do. What are the results? Somebody says it's useless. Somebody says, okay, go ahead with the trials. So in early stage, it's fine. Otherwise, for the later stage, I don't think it will work. So thank you very much, Dr. Roli.
and Dr. Thank you, ma'am, for giving me the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Nice Thank you, Rondi, for being so supporting and being so quick and doing it so well, informative, elaborative, and really enlightening the topic on so many aspects of epithelial ovarian cancer. Uh, next time, let's see what the participants have to <laughs> uh, put forth which topic. So we are waiting for that. And uh, so we take your leave. Yes, my thanks, Clarinet, for your technical support. Seamless, not so much, but okay. Ah, yes, Minu, you are again back. Uh, you can give your take home messages and conclude. Okay, thank you, organizer, Dr. Chaturvedi, Dr. Dipti, Dr. Roli, and all who are connected with us. So uh, take home message is that ovarian malignancy still we have to work hard because the female, even young female, where they require the fertility sparing surgery has to be multidisciplinary. Patient consensus is must. Patient family has to be involved with the oncopathologist, molecular oncologist, uh, definitely oncosurgeon. And um, this is a group and supportive care is very important. Sport group like because it's the era of uh, the costly drugs, spark inhibitors, it, uh, genetic cancer is very important and uh, they have to be diagnosed at early stages with the awareness with the because the symptoms are not uh, so much with this malignancy but with the awareness treated ultrasound and all that routine programs they have to be wise has to be there in our country also we are getting good number of cases but most of the cases are in advanced stages. So this can be taken care once there is a multidisciplinary uh, forum is there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, then we take your leave, all of you. Goodbye and see you again in the next webinar. Okay. Thank you, Chaturvedi sir. Thanks. Thank you, Chaturvedi ma'am. Thank, Thank you so, you much, so much to all of you. you. Thank you, Mamita. For Thank you so much, ma'am. Papa guidance. <laughs> And with all okay. your permissions, uh, I'm mm -hmm. closing the session for today. I'm yeah. looking forward to hosting you again. Thank you so much, ma'am. Okay, Good night. Bye.